Hello everyone. My name is Katie and I'm the Marketing and Events Manager here at Blink and I'll be your host for this afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this virtual Vibe event. It's our last one for 2023 and it's a particularly exciting one as we're joined by two fantastic speakers, Steve Penno and John Rich from NPI. And um, they're going to be exploring the topic of regenerative agriculture practices in New Zealand. As we face the challenges of climate change and the need for sustainable agriculture, regenerative practices have emerged as a really promising solution. But how can we ensure that these practices are effective and evidence based? Well, hopefully Steve and John will answer that for us today, and as well as discussing MPI's perspective on regenerative agriculture and what it can mean for New Zealand and what MPI is doing to add to the current evidence base for regenerative agriculture practices in New Zealand. So I'm going to start just by covering some quick housekeeping points. As a default, all participants are muted and all webcams are switched off. So don't panic, we cannot see or hear you. It makes for some challenging presenting. <laughs> um, this webinar will be recorded and it's sent, sent out to you after the event, which means you can spend some time listening rather than taking notes. And there will be a Q&A session once all of our speakers have finished, both of our speakers have finished. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and I can pose those questions on your behalf. I'm sure everyone is dying to get stuck into listening to what our speakers have to say, but just before I introduce them, I just want to take one minute to tell you about B-Link, especially for those who haven't attended one of our events before. Um, so B-Link is a business unit for Lincoln University. We are an agricultural innovation hub that specializes in the facilitation of innovative ideas in not only the Canterbury region, but nationwide. So we hold events primarily focused on innovative solutions and inspiring people at farm gate industry and academia we love to bring you exciting events like this one where we can address the topical issues facing the ag industry and i think that that's the best segue to introduce our speakers for this afternoon so um we are joined by steve penno um so steve is currently the director of in, sorry, of investment programs and has worked with MPI for nine years. Steve grew up on a 400 acre mixed cropping farm in South Canterbury and has more than 25 years experience managing investment in innovation and technology in both the private and public sectors. Prior to this, Steve managed the primary growth partnerships and has worked in senior roles at New Zealand Trade and Enterprise and previously managed investment in the high tech industry. Welcome, Steve. We're also joined by John Roach. So John was appointed C Chief Science Advisor in June 2018 to provide independent and strategic science advice to the Director General and to provide leadership in the wider ministry science areas. In 2022, John took on the additional role of Director for On-Farm Support to establish an on-the-ground service for farmers and growers. I think that's a little bit of a, of, a, of a kind of overview of our two speakers, but who could do it better themselves than um, the two of them? So over to you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And if you wouldn't mind starting up with your slides. Great. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, thanks for the introduction. And thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to um, come and have a chat with you, I guess, about um, MPI's um, uh, perspective on uh, regenerative farming practices in New Zealand and the work we're doing to um, uh, to support work in this area. Uh, so regenerative farming has obviously been um, something that's had growing interest from farmers in New Zealand for quite a few years now. Um, it's uh, been seen, I guess, as an opportunity for both uh, potentially getting more value from our products and market and also um, opportunities for new farming practices that can help us reduce our um, impact on the environment in New Zealand. Um, back in 2019, really MPI started uh, leaning into the um, regenerative um, farming area to support industry with peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer learning between farmers with support through Quorum Sense. Um, John did a whole lot of work around engaging across the sector to put together a technical advisory group and understand what regenerative farming could mean in a New Zealand context. And we also um, put out a call for 
um, research proposals to um, generate more evidence, uh, a strong scientific evidence base for how regenerative farming practices could be applied in New Zealand. Um, so what John and I want to talk through today is, um, I guess, the background to MPI's perspective on regenerative farming and how, how what it could mean for New Zealand, um, to uh, talk about the the definition of uh, regenerative farming, um, that uh, how it could apply in New Zealand that um, we've worked through with uh, the sector and also to give a, uh, a bit of an overview of some of the funding that we've put into um, research um, projects to understand how regenerative farming practices could be applied in New Zealand. So um, with that as a bit of an intro, I'll hand over to John. So, um, talk about some of the, the background for Regen and MPI's thinking. Kāpai, tanakwe Steve. Uh, kia ora tātou, ko Krokon toka manga, ko Men toka awa, ko Norman, ko Kelt, ko Irish o ko Iwi, ko County Kerry toko Hapu, ko John Roche toko Ingwa. Good afternoon everyone and it looked like Steve, I wanted to thank Katie uh, for the opportunity to be here this afternoon and Thank all of you guys for tuning in. I'm um, looking forward to having a conversation around this. Um, so I'll just just to kick into it. Um, he, humanity is is facing a a huge challenge. Um, this is the amount of food that the world has to produce, um, has produced up till now and has to produce over the next 30 years to feed humanity. And to put that into perspective, we have to produce almost as much protein in the next 30 years as we did in the last 2000 years. So that's an extraordinary uh, challenge. And for the first time in human history, there is no more land. In fact, most would agree that some of the land we have converted to agriculture probably should be retired. It wasn't the right decision at the time. And so we need innovation. At the same time, we're faced with a changing climate um, and, and one that almost exclusively undermines our ability to produce food. Uh, it doesn't matter what st statistic you look at, whether it's drought, temperatures, floods, extreme weather events, they're all on the up and they're all making it far more difficult to produce the food that we have as consistently as we have and as widely around the world as we have. And these are all offering challenges. Remember, there's only nine meals between humankind and anarchy. So uh, the ability to produce food is incredibly important. At the same time, we've got we've got social movements uh, that would would have you believe that uh, our food production systems are unsustainable and that they need to change. In fact, at the extreme version of this, you have the view that you can either have a healthy and vibrant planet or you can have animal agriculture, but you can't have both together. And I think the concept of regenerative agriculture um, offers us an opportunity to have that conversation in a very mature way. And many of our um, many of our consumers are, are removed from farming, have been removed from farming and food production for many generations now, um, and, and have, have never experienced the true pangs of food shortages. Now, I realize there are people in our country where affording food is, is difficult, and, and I don't mean to be glib about that, but for the vast majority of the developed world, um, there is an abundance of food and it has never been as cheap as it is now. And so people are awash with it and they're concerned about how we produce it. The other thing I, I just want, want to, you to think on is um, how people think. And if you, you know, there's multiple concepts out there of right brain, left brain thinking that the, the left brain makes rapid emotional decisions, the right brain holds that in check. Or Daniel Kahneman uh, used to talk about system one and system two. So your system one in your brain makes rapid decisions. If you're you're standing in the middle of the road and a car comes rapidly at you, you don't stop to think how fast is that car going? How long is it going to take before it reaches me? You just jump out of the way. That's That's the system one part of your brain making rapid decisions to keep you alive. System two is the side of your brain that takes all of your energy. You know, you have to sit down and add up the columns of a ledger to see whether you're making money or not. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're the two parts of it. And the, and the old belief was that system one or the left-hand side of your brain, uh, they buy an emotion. And then the system right is, uh, is the one that controls that emotion and helps you be logical about it. 
I don't think they're. I don't think that that's quite right. In my experience of of looking at consumers all around the world, people buy an emotion and then they justify with logic. So the left hand side of the brain uh, encourages you to buy things, and the right hand side of the brain justifies why you bought it. It's one of the reasons why I have a seventy inch TV inside in my TV inside in my lounge room is the rugby ball was too small on a sixty five inch TV. There was no other reason. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't massively justified. And Seth Godin uh, sums this up well, where he, he his quote is that people do not buy goods and services. They buy relations. They buy stories. They buy magic. There's plenty of of marketing experts out there that you can listen to um, that sell that exact same story. The the, the book, um, you, you Start With Why, is, a, is a, another example of that. And that's good for New Zealand, in my opinion, because it means people are buying the process. They're not just buying the product. And what they're asking for, in again, in my opinion, is a balance between economic growth and environmental sustainability. Everyone knows the farmers have to live, they have to earn enough money uh, to pay their bills, to rear their family, to enjoy their life. And so no one is, is denying that, that farmers have to make money as well. But we all want to leave a better world for our children and our grandchildren. And, and likewise, in all my interactions with farmers all over the world, and I have been blessed to be able to interact with farmers in many different countries, I have never met a farmer that doesn't want to leave the land that they've inherited or purchased in a better state for the next generation than they received it. And so I think there's a there's a meeting of the waters, if you will, in in terms of this objective. And but people's views on this and particularly that that earlier slide uh, where they they care a lot about how their food is produced without knowing much about how it is produced is leading to a lot of the multinationals setting targets for our food producers, setting targets for our food and fiber producers. So Nestle, the largest food manufacturer in the world, for example, is looking to reduce its emissions by 20%, its greenhouse gas emissions by 20% by 2025, 50% by 2030, and to be net zero emissions by 2040 at the latest. This is one of the major purchasers of our dairy products in the world. And Nestle is only one of them. There's a, there's a bunch that I put up on that slide and although the figures might be different, the intent is all the same. Uh, so there's a desire to produce more food with a smaller environmental footprint. And that's led me to my, my thoughts. And you'll see in big red letters here, my opinion. This is not a ministry opinion. And not certainly not all of my colleagues will necessarily share this opinion. But as I've looked at the debate that has raged over this over the last several years, I believe there are three fu futures to food. So there's the commodities, uh, 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 and, and we do it well. We, we do commodities probably better than anybody else. We produce the highest quality food. Uh, we produce it at a lower cost than the vast majority of our competitors, and we produce it at a lower environmental footprint than the vast majority of our competitors. If you think of a full life cycle analysis, we can put a rack of lamb in a supermarket shelf in the United Kingdom uh, with a lower carbon footprint than a UK farmer can. That's an extraordinary indictment of the ability of our farmers and growers to produce high quality merchandise with a low environmental footprint. But commodities are always going to be defined by the person that can pay the least for them. So as we send meat overseas and we send milk products overseas and we send wool and other textile products overseas, it is the person that can pay the least for those that determines the price of those products overseas by and large. Because if, if that wasn't the case, then some enterprising individual would head to that country, buy the products off those people and take them to another market and sell them at a premium if, we, if, if the premium for commodities was that uh, different around the world. So a commodity is always going to be a race to the bottom in price. And considering the quality of our products, maybe that's not where we want to put all of our products. The second category, I would say, is the new foods. And there's a lot of discussion about new foods, whether that's fermented milk or lab-grown meat or insect protein. Um, and some of these, um, you know, some of these are, are making inroads in, in the marketplace. Uh, most have had a very niche consumer base up till now, um, but there is a large amount of dollars being invested in the development of these products. And if you were to take that is being any marker of their success into the future, you would have to back at least some of these products to win. Um, 
some of them have questionable nutrition. You know, some of them are, are ultra processed foods made to taste good with a wide variety of ingredients, some of which are probably not the best for our health. But that's not a case for all of them. Many of them will mimic the quality of some of our traditional foods very, very well. But to be able to compete, they'll also have to be commoditized. And to be commoditized, they'll have to be low cost and therefore low value to the producer. And so these these two are these two types of 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 uh, products are, are um, these these two um, categories of products. Sorry, is the word I'm looking for um, are a race to the bottom in price. But I think we have a huge opportunity in New Zealand, and that's in what we're calling modern regenerative foods. So these foods are natural. They've got a low environmental footprint. They've got good nutrition and they taste great. They've got strong animal welfare credentials and the list goes on and on and on. They capture carbon in the soil. They're good for biodiversity. What, whatever interests our marketplace, whatever interests our consumers, whatever interests our urban peers here in New Zealand, these are the things that we can be defined by in our food production methods. So what do we mean by regenerative? Like um, Robert Roddale in in the United States in the 1970s is is uh, accredited with coming up with the term regenerative and and um, in my listening to uh, Robert uh, Bob Bob Robdale uh, he describes it as sustainable isn't good enough because sustainable means we can continue to do bad things forever um, in such a way that it, it we we can get by whereas the concept of regenerative was recognizing that in some of our landscapes, we have done things that in hindsight, we probably wish we had done differently. And we will regenerate those as well as producing high quality food. And that's that's the concept of the word. And the word does tend to bring out different emotions in different people. And as we look globally, there's multiple reviews written about regenerative agriculture. There's almost no consistency in, in a definition of regenerative agriculture. Um, there's three of them up here that these are just three random ones that I've picked. Um, but as you look through them, they, they focus very heavily on, on degraded soil systems, um, soils that have been have undergone or have, have gone under the plow for the last century or more, where structure has been degraded, organic matter has been lost, the microbiome and even the macrobiome has been uh, damaged by the practices that have been undertaken, whether that's chemical or physical. Um, but the majority of these definitions weren't really appropriate for New Zealand, re not really appropriate for Aotearoa. And um, in, as part of the post-COVID uh, e economic recovery plan, uh, MPI um, and the Prime Minister launched this, I think, in, in 2020, um, was the Fit for a Better World was a plan. And... Two, two items in there stood out um, to us. One was having a regenerative mindset. So a systems level holistic management strategy to balance economic return with diversity and respect for the connection with past and future generations, taking a Taiao approach, uh, recognizing that, that deep respect and reciprocity that we have with the land. We look after the land, the land looks after us. Ethical production systems producing outstanding products that are unique to New Zealand. And so it was important that whatever regenerative agriculture was to everybody else, we needed to decide what it was for us. So as Steve mentioned, we pulled together a technical advisory group because the more I read, the more confused I got. Um, and it was very clear with the farmers and growers that I, I, I met with around the country that they didn't want a definition because a definition would prescribe how they needed to farm. And that wasn't useful um, to them. But what they did want was a vision. And, and, and one of the reasons for latching on to regenerative agriculture was because it was an outcome-based philosophy. They were able to define what they wanted to achieve. And to, they, we put that down in writing. Now, it's a long, it's a long vision. There's no question about that. We had uh, 25 people in our technical advisory group that represented farmers and growers, represented scientists, represented marketing business people, and represented iwi. And so when you've got 25 people in a, in, um, in a technical advisory group, all vying for a piece of space in a, in a vision statement, it's never going to be a bottle of Coke in everybody's hand. Um, but I, 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 I 
really am drawn to the vision because it is everything that I want to accomplish in 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 my working life. And uh, it recognized two things. A, we weren't talking about a noun. We were talking about a vision. We were talking about a journey. And so it was a series of verbs rather than a noun. Uh, we're talking about regenerative practices being practices that in isolation or collectively can achieve improved outcomes for our productive landscapes, rivers, coastal and marine environments, biodiversity and natural ecosystems, improve animal welfare, have potential to increase profitability and add value, promote health and well-being for humans, whilst ensuring we can grow and consume our food and fiber products sustainably and meet our goals of Taiao, Fenua Ora, Maori Ora and Te Ao Turoa. And I presented this vision to Alan Savory. I was fortunate enough to spend to have a couple of meetings with Alan Savory around this very subject. And uh, it, it, some of the earlier uh, iterations, he suggested that there was changes to it. And um, but he, I think, I don't want to be putting words in his mouth, but certainly the interpretation I took from our conversations was that he he was appreciative of of the vision that we had put together. And what this vision means is that farmers should be recognised for the good practices that they are already undertaking. The arable farmers that are undertaking minimum till farming, which um, has in, in some instances can have impacts on soil carbon, but even where it doesn't have impact on soil carbon, it does have impacts on soil biodiversity, water retention, the ability to grow companion crops and, and retain soil structure, etc. Rotational grazing, what New Zealand is, is synonymous for um, and what we have done for many, well, for almost 100 years. Fencing waterways, riparian planting, planting native species, wetland restoration, looking after staff through training and welfare programs because he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, a, re, a regenerative system must look after the people. And just to borrow a phrase from one of my colleagues in MPI, Glenn Katu, he described it as being on a continue, a journey of continuous improvement to revitalize Papatuanuku. What does the consumer think about this? Well, uh, the consumers uh, surveyed internationally believe that New Zealand farming systems are viewed as more regenerative than our international competitors. So on a scorecard here, New Zealand scored 83. Next closest to us was Australia, and we were a long way ahead of either the UK or the USA. So the, the markets, uh, I will come to the markets and their understanding of regenerative in a second, but they certainly regard New Zealand as being more regenerative than our competitors. 59% were willing to pay for more regenerative beef if it could be globally recognized uh, uh, through some form of regenerative certification and that the proposition was effectively communicated to them. So again, strong, strong signal from consumers. We talked with farmers, and by we, I mean the Royal We. These were, these were surveys that were funded by uh, uh, MPI through SFF Futures and uh, Beef and Lamb and New Zealand Wine Growers that 79% of, of farmers in New Zealand believe their systems should be classified as regenerative, and 70% believe that all of the systems of farming here in New Zealand were regenerative. So that's that's where we're, we're sitting, that's where the consumers are sitting. And I'd just like to pass back to Steve now to talk about why we're funding research in this space. Thanks, John. So um, as I mentioned earlier, back in uh, 2020, um, we recognized that um, I guess there's uh, around the regenerative area, there's uh, a need for more information. Um, we've seen growing interest from a lot of farmers about uh, regenerative practices, wanting to know more, wanting to know how they, how they might be able to incorporate it into their own farming systems on their properties. What we, uh, as John mentioned before, um, some core practices that are seen as being regenerative, like rotational grazing, They've been a part of New Zealand's farming system for many, many years, and New Zealand's really recognised for that. And we have some, we have decades of science that help us understand the benefits of that and to our farming system and the benefits of that to our, our soils and our environment. Um, but it's really important that we don't stop there. We need to continue building our knowledge of the systems that we use, um, the impact that they have on our environment. So our contemporary New Zealand practices, we need to continue research on. In terms of new practices, um, uh, um, practices as a part of um, regenerative farming that people are adopting, there's um, some studies being done internationally as to the benefits of those. There's um, uh, um, some, I guess, uh, anecdotal evidence from people adopting that on their own um, properties. 
Um, but what we really need to understand, and I think what we've found that there is a bit of a gap on is when we look at different practices, how do they actually work in our soils and our climates and our farming systems? And so um, that really, uh, I think, was underpinned um, MPI's decision to really lean in to help with getting more scientific studies done on adopting those practices within New Zealand. And the other thing I think it's really important to recognise is that we all can see that we're um, in a changing climate. Um, a climate I think we're finding is changing more rapidly than we thought it might do. Um, John mentioned um, increasing weather events earlier. Um, we've got areas of New Zealand that are becoming warmer and drier, some places becoming wetter. Um, and also our markets are changing as well. Um, increasing interest from consumers about how their food is, food is produced, um, as well as its quality. And so we need to keep adding as many tools to our toolkit as we can to help us respond to those changes. So if we can move on to the next slide, please, John. So over the last few years, um, since we put out a call for proposals around research, we've been progressively um, providing um, support through funding to industry proposals for researching different aspects of um, regenerative uh, agriculture in New Zealand. So to date, we've invested in 13 projects. Um, those span right across the country. So we're looking to intentionally make sure that we are um, providing uh, support to projects that will provide good knowledge about regenerative practices in different parts of New Zealand. It also covers different aspects of uh, regenerative practices, so looking at things like pasture, multi-species pasture, impact on soil, different um, nutrient management approaches, um, and also with a range of different organisations. We have some traditional research organisations, we've got some um, uh, companies that are very focused on market, we've got some uh, um, companies like Countdown and Denone that are involved in some of our projects as well. And also really uh, we've recognised that there's a very strong connection in terms of um, values and outcomes that we're seeking for, um, between Mataranga Māori and um, the values behind uh, regenerative agriculture. So we've seen, we've um, really worked to build that into the projects that we're funding as well. Um, if you want to know some more about individual projects, I'd encourage you to go to MPI's website. If you um, head to the SFF Futures pages on MPI's website, you can look through the, pro the projects that we've funded and can search for regenerative um, projects to learn more about them individually. And so if you move on to the next one, John. Um, so really in the projects that we've funded, we really are um, seeking to um, reinforce the importance of scientists and industry and particularly farmers and working together. Um, that's where we really are going to get the benefits out of providing um, good information that's um, uh, got sound scientific basis and is going to be of value to farmers and growers in terms of knowing what they could adopt on their own, um, within their own farming systems. As I mentioned, we're looking to cover a really wide range of regenerative practices um, and look at integrating Mahmatarana Maui. An important part of the projects that we're funding as well is that we really um, have focused on comparative studies. So within the portfolio, there are many um, projects that are doing side-by-side -side studies of um, conventional, modern conventional um, New Zealand farming practices and different um, practices that are part of a can be part of a regenerative system. Um, and that's at a, a plot scale, at a paddock scale, and also at a farm scale. We've got some side-by-side -side farming um, comparisons. So through those projects, we expect to get some really quality information on what the um, what the outcomes that can be achieved through different regenerative practices and also what it means for those farms and for the people working on the farms and for integrating within those farming systems. And the most important thing through all of this is um, useful information for farmers and growers. We don't want to um, end up with a great set of published scientific papers. Um, our outcome that we're seeking from all of this is to make sure that it's um, practical and useful information that people can adopt and, and uh, use it to um, help underpin the decisions that uh, people are making actually on the land within their farming systems. Um, let's move to the next slide, John. Uh, so I guess in summary, um, 
we uh, recognise that New Zealand has a, a really um, long-standing tradition of being seen globally as a, a leader around um, agricultural um, research. Um, and we really want to um, see that we're building on that in terms of research into what regenerative um, farming practices mean for us. Um, we're recognising that uh, New Zealand, we're in a unique place down here in the bottom of the South Pacific. Um, a, we have a unique um, landscape, um, a unique geological history. Um, and as a consequence of that, we have quite a unique farming system. Um, and what works overseas isn't necessarily going to work here. And we really need to understand what do these practices mean for New Zealand. And, and finally, we uh, recognising the need to have a really good evidence base um, for what works in New Zealand. Um, that uh, um, uh, observation and anecdotal evidence is important. Um, that can lead us to where there are um, things that can be beneficial for us and it, it's not enough on its own. We really need to apply the science and learn what that science tells us. And, and overall, I guess this um, can form part of um, our response as New Zealand within our food and fibre industries as a, a response to a changing world. Changing world in terms of what our consumers are looking for, in terms of our markets, and changing world in terms of our climate and how we're responding to that and how we're... Um, looking to um, improve our footprint on our landscape. Um, so uh, I thank you for the time to, to have a chat with you about um, kind of MPI's perspective on this regenerative space. Um, it's an area that um, people have very strong feelings about, um, an area that um, we've seen as being really important that uh, MPI leans into. Um, and um, yeah, we'd really like to uh, use the, the remaining time that we have for I guess a, an open discussion with you um, and uh, to um, respond to any questions that you might have. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve and John. I found that really interesting and I'm sure that the audience did too. I see that we already have some um, questions coming in and um, as we go through them, I'll just encourage everyone else to have a wee think and, and type some in. If you hover your mouse over the bottom, you'll be able to see the Q&A function and you can post in there whether you do that under your name or anonymously. Um, Let's get stuck in, shall we? <laughs> so uh, this first question um, is, is for you, John. So uh, whilst you started on the biophysical issues such as climate heating, biodiversity loss, etc., facing farming and humanity as a whole, you really focused in on the consumer and the market side. One of the key aspects of Regen to date is that it has been focused on reducing the impact of the farm on the wider environment, e.g. soil health, which is um, the opposite of market focused. So why did you pick such a market perspective to frame Regen in Aotearoa? It's, it's a great question. Thanks, Charles. Um, look, th that wasn't my intention. Uh, obviously, we were limited by time because we, we did want to um, leave time for questions because I think this is where both myself and Steve will get greatest enjoyment and hopefully you guys will get um, most value. Uh, so I, I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. Um, I think our, our vision speaks very much to practices that will lead to environment, environmental outcomes that we all want for Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, but at the same time, recognizing that if people are willing to pay more for our farmers doing more, um, then we should take advantage of that and not be foolish about um, ignoring that. And, and And certainly all of the market research that we've seen is that there is currency in in the concept of regenerative agriculture, the concept of improving biodiversity within productive landscapes, protecting our soil and water, and so in in all of the um, experiments that that Steve talked to, they are the focuses. Uh, we've we've had a few small projects looking at the market side of it, but virtually our entire research portfolio is on. Um, is on achieving our environmental outcome. So my I appreciate the question because that wasn't the intent of my of, of my presentation was to leave you with uh, the cold heart commercial side of uh, John Roach. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that, if that's okay. I, I think it is a really a really um, insightful question and and one uh, we see the consumer perspective and what people might be prepared to pay more for, um, what they value as 
actually quite a separate question from what are the things that can help um, us reduce our footprint on the world through our farming practices. And um, if everything goes really well for us, those things might align. And the things that we adopt and uh, introduce within our farming um, are things that consumers value and that they'll pay more for through our products. Just as, as we've found, we uh, have rotational grazing as a part of our system because it's a better way of farming. Um, and now we've found that that's something that uh, has become a core part of um, some regenerative practices and something that consumers are valuing. So separate, but hopefully align and mean we can get value from doing the right thing on the land. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, uh, is there any research in the hill country farming and Maori values? Uh, so we definitely have some research which is focusing on, um, on hill country. Um, and uh, we also have project projects that are incorporating Matadanga Māori. Um, uh, as to whether those two are combined in the one project, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I can't quite recall, um, but uh, those two things are definitely being looked at across in multiple projects across the portfolio. And if I can just add to that, Katie, as well, uh, the the list of projects we've we've put up there are specifically ones that were applied for under a regenerative banner. There's we SFF Futures has a very large portfolio of projects outside of that that um, uh, that that also would be would be aligned with a lot of the, the the ideas that we're trying to achieve here as well, and that have both a Mataranga Māori um, component to them, but also, as Steve said, we have significant investments in, in hill country research as well, particularly in, in pasture and getting better utilisation of the pastures. Mm. And, and, and actually, if you do go to the NPI website, as I suggested earlier, and um, look at our portfolio of regenerative projects, you'll see many more than the 13 that we've highlighted here. Um, the 13 are the ones where there's a, a strong focus on the research um, and we've actually been supporting projects that are incorporating regenerative practices um, for um, quite a few years, well before we put out our call for proposals. Thank you. So the next question, how do you see the relationship between regen, regen and agroecology? Again, it's a great question, Charles. Um, uh, I, I, I haven't seen a great definition uh, of either region or of agroecology. But what I do see are the underlying principles are very much aligned. And I think one of the key things that we need to achieve on the commercial side, on that marketing side of region, if our, if our companies are to use that, and a number of our companies are using that in their marketing strategies, is to make sure that our vision and what we're trying to achieve in New Zealand encompasses the principles of agroecology and other forms of sustainability that other countries use. So agroecology tends to be, from, from what my reading, and maybe I'm simplistic, so please don't take this as, as um, an absolutely definitive, it's what Europe is trying to define as uh, in a similar manner to what we're trying to um, define as regenerating Aotearoa. Again, falling into the trap door of defining it as a noun, uh, what we've tried to do is create these any practices that result in these outcomes are regenerative practices and therefore farmers can look at those practices and say that will suit my system and i'm prepared to do it so the choice is with the farmer and the grower rather than those of us that think we know things telling them what they should do thank you um so this one um is an interesting one, I think. What needs to occur to prevent regenerative agricultural production from also becoming commoditized? Hmm. It's a good question. I, <laughs> I, I, I mean, is would that be an issue? Would, wouldn't wouldn't that be success? Um, I mean, if, if if we're true to to our word, which um, you know, Steve quite eloquently. Put, put out that we, we're separating out the uh, op marketing opportunity if it exists from the environmental footprint that we're trying to achieve. I, I could only think that it would be success if we commoditized regenerative agriculture to the success of our environmental goals. Um, but in terms of 
I, I presume the question is around commoditizing it at the marketing level. And I think that that will come down to our measurements and the um, evidence that Steve mentioned that, you know, the importance of of having that evidence, having the metrics, being able to stand up to scrutiny that when you claim something is regenerative, that you're having this effect on biodiversity or this effect on water or this effect on a greenhouse gas footprint. I think that's probably going to be the most important thing because we do things very well in New Zealand. We need to continue doing things well and, and improve all the time. Um, and stay ahead of everybody else. So that, that to me would be how we would do it. The world is full of information now. I don't think you can hide behind make-believe standards anymore. You will be found out pretty quickly. Just an and, opinion. And, and important to recognise, I think, that we already have a number of New Zealand companies that are earning good premiums through products uh, they're selling internationally with uh, regenerative credentials. So an example is Atkins Ranch, so New Zealand farmed land, which is lamb, which is uh, being sold in North America for um, quite a reasonable premium. Um, and uh, we have a project where they can ranch around how they can expand their supplier base and uh, work with New Zealand farmers who could be suppliers uh, around what they need to do on farm to uh, be able to be part of their supplier base. So. Um, definitely some uh, areas where um, value is being um, created now. Challenges um, with a market lens, what are the opportunities for us to expand that and um, earn more of a premium across our uh, across our food and fiber sectors? Thank you. Um, how close are we to establishing a robust accreditation for food which is produced re regeneratively? Um, I, th that's, that is not on, on our work program that I'm, uh, that I'm aware of, Katie. Um, our, our strategy has been to try and understand what does regenerative mean in a New Zealand context and provide the evidence for practice change that farmers should, or should, should undertake or should avoid if, if the evidence doesn't exist, that it's going to return the value to, um, to them that they think, uh, that they think it should, um, We've left the standard side of it and the marketing side of it to the companies that are are doing such a good job. Atkins Ranch, as Steve mentioned, New Zealand Merino, many others have have um, good environmental credentials. They may not necessarily be using the word regenerative, but the basis um, for the 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 uh, claims they're making are certainly fall into the vision that we've created nationally. Mm, I think there's uh, I've got a, a two part answer to that. I think one thing is that really what we're looking for in terms of adopting practices on farm is reducing our, our footprint. Uh, and so that'll be measured through things like uh, reduced greenhouse gases from farming, um, improved biodiversity on, on the land, improved water quality. And so those things are measures of the outcomes of adopting those uh, practices as opposed to a um, an accreditation for using those practices. And as John said, when it comes to consumers in the market, though those who are best placed to put um, uh, accreditation or um, uh, other forms of um, kind of transparency through to consumers, um, the companies that are, are actually interacting with those consumers and markets are the best ones to do that. Um, and we are seeing companies like, um, like Aikens Ranch and NZ Marino do that with their own um, different accreditation systems. Thank you. So regenerative agriculture by its name is typically focused on agriculture. So how do you see these regenerative principles being applied in a perennial horticultural context? I guess um, I'll, I'll take that one. We're being a bit lazy and using regenerative agriculture as a uh, shorthand for regenerative practices, but we really see um, the potential right across our food and fiber um, sectors. So we have some projects within our portfolio that are specifically looking at um, regenerative practices within horticulture. So we have um, uh, one with Countdown and Lever Brand uh, looking at uh, uh, regenerative practices within uh, vegetable production. Um, we have another project which is not we haven't actually tagged it as uh, regenerative because it's one we'd already invested in for slightly different reasons, looking at um, other vegetable production systems and um, uh, different 
uh, practices like composting that can be brought into those systems around managing nutrients. Um, so uh, yeah, that's probably us just uh, using shorthand and and uh, making it seem like it's a bit narrower than it is. And just, just to add to that, I agree completely. And we've also got the one in viticulture with Brigato as well, Steve. Yeah. Um, uh, we 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 moved away from the term regenerative agriculture. Um, actually, Katie, uh, large largely out of a hui. So as part of the journey that Steve um, talked about earlier, we we had a technical advisory group of twenty five, and then we had a hui with with one hundred and fifty people um, back in I think twenty twenty one, and um, the it was put forward there that instead of talking about regenerative agriculture as a noun, we talk about regenerating Aotearoa. And so we could encompass all of the land-based industries underneath that kind of an umbrella. That's great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, if regenerative practices are the way forward, are there any plans to, in future, set specific guidelines or ways to recognise it on a farm level and reward farmers? I would take that as being quite similar to the question before about um, systems to uh, recognise regenerative practices and that the, um, where there are rewards that comes through, I guess, um, improving the, the, the environmental footprint um, that will be recognised through things like uh, um, farm plans and other things through regional councils. Um, and uh, uh, if everything goes as we'd like it to, we'll also have consumers willing to pay more for our products and it's through the um, the systems to provide transparency to those consumers um, that uh, uh, reward would come. Thank you. Um, are there specific regenerative practices coming out of the research so far that are looking particularly promising for New Zealand? Are you able to share that? I think it's probably fair to say that it's quite early days. Um, when we're looking at um, farming systems, um, we need to make sure that it's repeatable between seasons. Um, it takes time to set up uh, the research systems, build things like lysimeters to measure uh, uh, nitrate loss um, and to um, establish pastures and things. Most of these projects have only been running for um, a year to 18 months um, and also most of them are five to seven years long to make sure we can get a really good solid evidence base that we know is repeatable um, so that uh, we, we're getting good information out of them. So. We're all itching to see what the results are going to be. Um, we'll be making sure that um, programs uh, share results as early as possible. Um, it's just uh, yeah, quite early on in terms of the research that's being done. Yeah, and can I can I just add to that, Katie? Uh, so there was a question earlier as to how are we going to get the research out as well. And unlike Steve, I am looking for high quality research papers uh, as well. But uh, as part of the contracts, all of the all of the um, groups that in that thirteen. Uh, they, they have met, we have brought them together to make sure that we've got very standard measurement protocols um, where, where we're measuring the same things, whether that's soil health or soil carbon, et cetera, that we're doing it the same way. Um, and that means that we have a very large geographical part of New Zealand covered. So different climates, different soil types, different enterprises, different management practices, but very similar measurements. So there's a, a level of consistency there that will help us really uh, induce some some really good facts out of the the portfolio of projects. Secondly, just the point that Steve made there, um, you know, five to seven years for an awful lot of these projects. In in my life in science, we haven't had those types of really long term projects exist at an applied agricultural scale for many many years. And so there's a huge opportunity here, which and this does excite me probably even more than the projects to train young people in farm and, and orchard systems um, so that we can rebuild that next generation of applied scientists and advisors through this program as well. I think that's a that that's an incredibly important and exciting part of the portfolio of work that Steve mentioned. Great, thank you. When it comes to comparative studies, are we comparing New Zealand's conventional against international conventional farming? And is the marginal cost of New Zealand's version of regenerative farming likely to be higher than achieving international regenerative standards? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the important, the important thing in our focus is 
making sure that there's a, a good body of information around different practices that could be applied in New Zealand um, and what the outcomes are that can be expected for those practices so that farmers are able to make their own choices around what they think they want to adopt and incorporate within their farming system. Um, I think uh, one thing which is really important within all of our studies is that we understand the costs and the economics of doing so, um, because uh, it is really important that we can um, maintain our low cost farming production system and uh, um, farmers are only going to be in a position to adopt new practices uh, if that can be done in an economic way. And so I guess all of that adds up to farmers being able to make their own decisions around what things they incorporate, what that means for their own cost structures and their own profitability. Um, but what we're, we're not trying to say, here's how New Zealand compares to an international system is totally focused on uh, what can work in New Zealand. Yeah, can I just add, add to that? Thank you, Colleen. That's a that's a lovely Irish name, by the way. Um, uh, it's a it's a great question, and just as Steve said, we we are measuring as much as we can in all of these different projects. So there's some of these projects are much bigger than others. So the Naitahu project, the Massey, uh, Fenohamana project, they're they're much larger than some of the other projects. And so we're measuring everything from uh, the, the biophysics of, of, of farming, obviously, the profitability, the social side of this. So the hours worked and um, even down to uh, some measurements on the stress level of staff under those different management systems as well. So we're trying to get as much as as much information as we can, because, uh, you know, some farmers may well may, may be willing to earn a little bit less in a more stressful um, operation. Uh, and so it's about having all of those measurements to allow farmers and growers to make informed choices for themselves. Thank you. How does regenerative practices relate to best practice? And are cumulative impacts of regenerative practices still likely to be a challenge in some areas? It's a good, you know, it's a good question. Uh, one, one, uh, there was a particular, um, a particular person that uh, doesn't like the word regenerative, and we had many, many conversations when, when we first started out on this journey, and when the vision was presented at that hui I mentioned in 2021, I got an email the next day from him to ask me, "Can you tell me how this isn't just good farming?" And I said, "Now the penny's dropping." Uh, so. The 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 um, if we can accomplish everything in that vision, then that will be best management practices. Um, and I I think if if it compounds over time, then that's that's important. Obviously, we we don't we don't just want a step change. It would be really nice to get a step change and a continuous improvement from there. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. Is there an opportunity to combine regen practices with farm diversification or land change, land use change, given both have uncertainty and require research before farmers are likely to adopt? Does that provide an opportunity to help future proof their farm systems? I would say absolutely. And uh, providing the information to help inform those decisions is really what this uh, is all about. And, and it's one of the reasons why it's so important that we these, this portfolio of work is connected to farmers, that, that farmers are, are, are seeing it live. Summer, farmers are contributing to the, the, the um, treatments that are put in place. Um, because I, 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 in, in my experience, land use change is driven by farmers. It's never driven by the research that's been undertaken. The research has then caught up with the farmers. Uh, to show that the value of it or to quantify the benefit of it. So I think that that hand in glove science farmer interaction is really important in this portfolio. Fantastic, thank you. Now, we only have a couple of minutes left. So just got, um, maybe not so much a, a question, but um, maybe you could tell us just a wee bit more about how on farm is progressing and what the long-term vision of it is. Um, it's very much not a regen question, but um, I, I'm I'm happy to Katie, but it'll use it'll use all the remainder of your time, <laughs> um, or I'm happy to take that conversation with someone offline if if that's what we, I'll leave awesome. that one to you as the moderator. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, I think actually we will wrap it up here. There are lots more questions and I'm sorry that we haven't had an opportunity to address all of them, but hopefully we've had a, um, a few really interesting ones. So thank you to everyone who did submit them. Um, and I, I'm just going to wrap it up there and say thank you again to Steve and John. Uh, we really do appreciate your time because I know how busy everyone is and um, everyone who, who attended, thank you for coming. Um,